Thank you for joining us for our online gathering at Hope Church in Las Vegas, Nevada. We exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. We're honored that you are tuning in. We hope you enjoy this service. Church family, my name is Cassie, and I wanted to thank you for taking the time to watch our online worship service today. Also, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. At Hope Church, we exist to connect people to live the life of a Jesus follower. If this happens to be your first time joining us, we want to get to know you better. Go ahead and open up the Hope Church LV app or visit hopechurchlv.com and click connect with us and fill out a short digital connection card so that we can do just that. Now here are a few things we want you to know about. Before you call our church your home, we believe there are some questions that you deserve to have answered. Questions like, what do we believe? Where are we going? And how are we going to get there? If you are ready to discover more and connect with our church, Discovering Hope is your best next step. Discovering Hope is a four week journey to help you find your place within the Hope family. Your next opportunity to join us is on Monday, July 12th at 6.30 p.m. To register, open up the Hope Church LV app or visit our website at hopechurchlv.com. Are you following us on social media? If you have your phone close by, open up Instagram or Facebook and give us a follow by searching Hope Church LV. Throughout the week, when you come across our content, don't be shy. We want to hear from you. Like, share, comment, or direct message us if you have any questions. Now, let's continue with our gather time. What's up, Hope Church family? Happy Father's Day, dads, out there. This week, we had what we called Revive 21, our summer camp for 6th through 12th graders. And so many students gave their lives to Jesus. We baptized lots of kids. But right now, since you couldn't see camp, we wanted to bring a little bit of camp to you. So we're gonna have a little bit of fun right now as we sing this out and worship together. Come on. When I think about your goodness, my heart is over. Come alive again 
God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant, faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. Unto the setting same, I will praise your name. Great is your faithfulness to me. Yeah. Seasons change, but you remain the same. Yeah, yeah. God from age to age, though the earth may pass away. Your word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove there's nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow out, remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great. God praise for his faithfulness. Amen. Last week in our services, we asked you to pray for our student ministry as we held camp for over 500 students and leaders. Church family, thank you so much for praying. 
Even as we record this, we are right now in the middle of an incredible week filled with God showing off in a big way in the lives of these sixth through 12th grade students. You can see some of them now. Here's a quick video to give you just a taste of what Revive Summer Camp 2021 has been like. Check this out. We say it often, but it really is true. We would not be able to do what we get the privilege of doing in the Next Gen Ministries of Hope Church without your continued financial generosity. I hope you know that when you give through Hope Church, your generosity is fueling the gospel being shared week in and week out to birth through 12th grade kids and students. Your generosity helps us provide resources to help them grow in their walk as Jesus followers and provide unforgettable experiences like we're enjoying right now where 500 students are hearing how much God loves them and has a plan for their lives. So thank you, Hope Church. And I wanna invite you today, if you have not already, to give through Hope Church to share in the mission locally and globally. Regardless if you're on campus or online for one of our services, there are multiple ways you can give and you can see several of those ways on the screen. Each week when we gather, we set aside time to pray together as a church family. And as we continue this Father's Day service, let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for today. Jesus, we thank you what we're getting to be a part of today as a, as a camp with over 500 people here. God, experiencing your love and getting to hear your gospel. Jesus, thank you for what you did this week. Thank you for this church. God, we pray as we continue our service now, God, would you use this service to shape us and to mold us into the people that you have created us to become. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for today. Amen. Jesus Christ, my Lord. 
Church family, isn't it so incredible to be in the presence of God? And I am so thankful for our worship team, Hope Creative. And before Pastor Brian comes, we wanna take a minute to posture our hearts, to continue in worshiping God's presence and to ready ourselves to receive the word. So pray with me. Dear God, we come to you today and we ask that you would settle our hearts in your presence that you would allow our minds to be open to what you have to say to us. God, that you would silence distraction and that you would feed us with your word and that we would leave your word today knowing exactly what you've called us to do. In your name we pray, amen. Oh, come on now, that was a cute little... Anybody grateful for Jesus this weekend? and the new life that he gives. Praise the Lord. Well, what a joy it is to be here with you. Happy Father's Day weekend. Uh, Several weeks ago, ladies, it was your turn. Hope you feel blessed. But it's our weekend, and if we want to sit in front of the TV the whole time, then let us be. All right? Brothers, can I get an amen? in the house. Now don't amen too loud. You might be on the sofa. And don't email me because I ain't going to be any help to you at all. If you have your Bibles, please meet me in Psalm 127. I just want to give a word of encouragement uh, specifically uh, to all the dads who are, who are plugging in, uh, whether or not you're in the room or you're online, however that looks like for you. Um, I'm also aware that um, uh, there are some ladies in the house, maybe you've gone through a divorce, uh, uh, maybe you've had a child out of wedlock, maybe you're like my sister who is just going, man, I've, I'm raising this young man, he's in his teenage years now, what do I do? Um, I think this word is for you as well, maybe it'll give you a grid for what to pray for in a mentor, someone to be able to speak into the life Uh, of that child of yours. I should hope everyone who calls himself a follower of Jesus Christ, uh, we want to be spiritual fathers. That's what discipleship is all about. We want to take the life uh, that has been deposited into us and we want to give it away in, in much the same way that Paul did with Timothy. But Psalm 127, let me just read it to you, um, lift up some principles by way of encouragement, and we can continue on. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, For he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb, a reward. Really underline this verse. We're going to camp out here. Like arrows, not boomerangs. Y'all missed that. Kids are arrows. We release them bad boys and they don't come back. All right? Like arrows, not boomerangs. In the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Will you pray one more time with me? Father, as goes the home, so goes society. We want to build and steward our homes, not according to our ideas, but according to the plans of our maker, architect, God. God, we've all made mistakes. We've blown it. I don't come here as an expert. I'm very much in process and there's man I looked at a rearview mirror of my journey with my own kids there there's a ton of mistakes a ton of stuff I'm still confessing and repenting of so I stand here with my fellow brothers and sisters so so father I do pray that you would 
stand in my body and think with my mind and speak with my tongue, Lord God. Those things you'd have us know, say, and do. As my grandmama used to say, put shoe leather on your word, we pray. Make it plain, make it practical, in Jesus' name, amen. On Monday, I'm going to get on a plane and fly out of here and go back east to North Carolina, where our family currently lives. And if you've if you've ever traveled from coast to coast, you know that flying from west to east, the trip goes a lot quicker because you've got a tailwind, something that's just pushing you to your destination. You get there a lot quicker. If you've ever flown from east to west, you know uh, that that journey takes a little bit longer. Even though you might be connecting to the same points, it takes a little bit longer. Why? Because when you go from east to west, you're fighting a headwind. You're just, you're just going against something that, that is not propelling you. It's, it's pushing against you. And on either, either trip, there's bound to be pockets of turbulence. Dads, I just want to say that, that if you've been entrusted with children, those kids are precious gifts from God entrusted to us. That everyone here has been, has been made on purpose and for a purpose. Your mom and daddy may not have planned on you being here, and one of the ways you know that again is if your closest sibling is a decade older than you, got news for you, Surprise. But even though you may be a surprise to your mom and dad, there's no such thing as a surprise to the sovereign God. There is a call on your life. There's a divine destiny on your life. And dads, what I want you to understand is that either by our presence or absence, either by our intentionality or passivity, we will serve as either a tailwind in the life of our kids or a headwind. We will either be used of God to push them to their God-ordained destiny, or they will find themselves in our adult years, like some of you right now, having to undo a lot of stuff they should have gotten while under our roof. And so I just need to ask you today, are you a headwind or a tailwind in the life of your kids? I'm not asking what your relationship is like with their mama. You may be divorced, and God's grace and mercy covers that. But just because it didn't work out with her doesn't give you the excuse to punt on your responsibilities to your kids. Oh, y'all, y- y'all talk to chocolate preachers around here. I, I like that. That's going to make me preach really fast. <laughs> World history is filled with individuals who grew up with headwind dads. I don't care how much money you may make in your life. I don't care how successful, how famous you are. That fatherhood wound is real. There was a famous actor of a generation or so ago. His name was Burt Reynolds. He was making about a million dollars a week at the height of his fame, making a million dollars a week. He couldn't stop thinking about his dad. This is what he said. He says, I would have killed for a hug from my father. Some of us know about a guy named Tupac Shakur, urban poet, rap artist. His most famous song is Dear Mama. In this song, Dear Mama, he says, He's just reminiscing about his headwind dad. He says, I had no love for the man because the coward wasn't there. I had lunch with a football player. He's well on his way to the Hall of Fame. If I said his name, you would, you would all know his name. I, I said over lunch, look, man, I've watched your career, and I, I've noticed in your career you always played, played with an edge. There was a thing of anger in you. Wait, Tell me about that. Where did that come from? He he said without flinching, here's where it came from. My dad never came to any of my games as a kid. He said, so as a kid, I thought if if I could just ball out one game, dad would be there. So he says, "I, I, I was driven and dad never showed up in little league, middle school, high school, 
college. And he says, every single game, I find myself now looking into the stands, wondering why he's not there. In his award-winning book, Iron John, Robert Bly says these words. Will you just drink them in slowly with me? He says this, not receiving any blessing from your father is an injury. If you're a young man and you're not being admired by an older man, you're being hurt. Not seeing your father when you are small, never being with him, having a remote father, an absent father, a workaholic father, is an injury. Let me just stop right here and give you some encouragement. Some of the best dads I've ever met in my life were dads who had a headwind for a father. And they made up in their minds, my kids will never feel the pain that I felt. They made up in their mind that they weren't going to be a victim, they were going to be a victor, that, that they weren't going to kind of be a slave to the past legacy of what their father or grandfather did or didn't do. They made up in their mind that I'm going to turn the page, I'm going to get into a new chapter, shoot, I'm going to throw this book away and start a new book. And my hope is that's exactly some of you all's choices this evening. You may have had a headwind for a dad, but you, by the power of the Spirit of God, do not have to continue that legacy. You can start a new one tonight. Psalm 127 shows us how to be a tailwind in the life of our kids. Psalm 127, it it is a part of the book called the Psalms. The Psalms, I believe, are kind of God's iTunes playlist. The the, the Psalms are songs that the people of God sang. In fact, our Psalm, Psalm 127, is part of a series of Psalms called the Psalms of Ascent. If you've ever been to to Jerusalem and and particularly the the, the temple, you understand that it sits on top of a mountain. So, So whenever you would go up to worship at the temple, no matter what direction you were coming from, north, south, east, or west, you always had to go up. And when you went up, you didn't go up with a nice cup of coffee, praise God for coffee, you went up singing. Before you got into the house, you were worshiping. And one of the songs that you were singing on the journey there was a song that is all about godly dads in a godly home. Isn't that interesting? God says, one of the worship songs I want you to sing, I I just want it to be a journey song, sort of like the songs we had growing up in my generation. We weren't blessed like kids. Y'all got it great today. You know, y'all go on road trips. They ain't even road trips now, right? You got got your DVD, well, DVD players, listen to me. You you got your iPads, your smartphones, you got all this stuff. We didn't have none of that, right? We we, we had stuff like um, journey songs, like 99 bottles of Coke on the wall, 99 bottles of Coke. Anybody here ever, ever sang that? Kind of on a long road trip, right? That's a journey song. That's a journey song. They're singing that journey song, but it's a song of worship. And what they're singing about is all about the centrality of God. And in our text, it is all about the centrality of God. Verse 1, it's the centrality of God in the home. Later on in verse 1, it's the centrality of God over the city. And then he goes back to the centrality of God in the home. Before that, it's the centrality of God at work. It, It is God being the foundation of everything that I do. And God says, That's what I want you to sing, that I am the absolute foundation. What this means for us dads is that we, step number one, we have to make up in our mind that, God, you are going to build my home. I'm not going to build it. God, you as the master architect, you build this home. Because if you try to build it, it ain't going to work out right. Some, uh, about a year or two ago, uh, about two years ago, my my wife and I, we were walking down the street in San Francisco, uh, Pastor Ed, and uh, we saw the Millennium Tower, San Francisco. Now, you should know that name, the Millennium Tower, because not long after it was built, 
one, one of the tallest buildings uh, in San Francisco, it started to lean. So I asked a, a builder friend of mine who's built a lot of, 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 um, of real estate in San Francisco. I had to kind of discern that he didn't build that, that tower. But once I discerned that, I asked him, what happened? Why, why does this thing immediately start leaning? Here's what he said to me. He said, Brian, much of San Francisco is built on landfill. And beneath the landfill is bedrock. And anyone knows that when you build anything in San Francisco, your foundations have to go exceptionally deep. You have to dig through the landfill and into the bedrock. He says the problem with this builder is his foundation stopped at the landfill and didn't go deep enough. And because of that, he had a failed building. Isn't that a fitting metaphor for how so many of us build our homes? We build our homes on the landfill of this culture. And as a result of that, our kids are leaning. Now, l- let me give you a couple examples of that. I was having a conversation with an Asian friend of mine, and I'm just saying, man, just talk to him about the difference between, you know, uh, Asian culture and, and American culture. And he said to me, he said this to me, he says, Brian, the way we parent is a lot different. It, it seems as if the primary preeminent value of most American homes when it comes to their kids is happiness. If there's just one word that sums up the typical American parents' aspirations for their kids, we just want them to be happy. So what do we do? We make them the center of our world. We eliminate struggle from their lives. We kind of give them everything they want. And then what happens? Having made them the center of the world, they then leave our home and find out real quickly in the real world, they ain't the center. So what do they do? They come back as boomerangs to the one place where they were. And because of that, they're not resilient. You know, I love reading biographies. Biographies are about great people, and the arc of all biographies, pretty much, it's this. Come from nothing, struggle, 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 then make it into greatness. And I remember just thinking to myself one day, you never really read biographies on their kids. Why is that? I think it's because these individuals who come from nothing, struggle, 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 make it. The first thing they say when they make it is, my kids will never have to struggle the way that I struggled. And so we handicap them from the very thing that made us great. Dads, one of the best gifts you can ever give to your kids is the gift of struggle. I remember, man, when I was 18 years old, man, graduated from high school, you know, we threw a big party at my house. We, you know, electric sliding and all that holy stuff at the house. And <laughs> New Edition was on the radio. This crowd don't know about New Edition. <laughs> oh, okay, so we're, we're, we're doing all that. And my mom taps me and she says, your dad wants to talk to you outside. And so I, I go outside and there's my dad standing on the brick p- patio. And he's got this fine set of china. And it's just a weird sight. He's crying, holding this fine set of china. And I'm like, Dad, what's, what's going on? He goes, man, this proud moment in your life. You're a man now, and you've graduated high school. In the middle of all that, he takes the fine set of china and just slams it on the brick patio. And it just kind of goes, and it shatters in all kinds of directions. I said, Dad, what are you doing? You, you, that, that's a couple hundred bucks that you've just shattered. He says, son, do you know what that was? I says, no, Dad. He says, that was your place setting. Son, you're going to college or military, but chilling around here, eating up all my food with no plan, not an option. (laughs) A bit extreme. (laughs) But where did the strength come for me to go, I'm going to leave a 6,000-person church to plant a church with 26 people in the living room? I had a dad who didn't coddle me. Dads, I want you to understand, your kids are a lot more resilient than you give them credit for. Second piece of landfill, I think we give our kids, I I think we build on the landfill of happiness, and I think a lot of homes, we build on the landfill of success. 
My Asian friend says it's real easy for me to rip on American homes, but if there's one word that describes a lot of Asian homes, it's the word success. We just want our kids to be successful. Now hear me. It, th these are good secondary aspirations. I want godly successful. So let's put an adjective on that. But the problem, if success is your bottom line, we're all, we're the only time our kids hear from us, I'm proud of you, is, is when they hit a home run or, 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 or they get an A. If that's the only time they hear that we're proud of them, we're, we're teaching them a performance ethic. You do know in the Gospels, Jesus only hears his father speak audibly twice. And both of those times, God says the same thing. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the first time he says that to him is at the start of his ministry. He ain't preached a sermon yet. He hadn't performed a miracle yet. He hasn't raised anybody from the dead yet. He hasn't gone to the cross. And in spite of not performing those things, God says, proud of you. Dads, your kids need to feel that. They don't need you going crazy at their athletic games. They're probably not going to make pro because they got your genes. <laughs> so chill out. Any emails, please email me at Pastor Vance at Hope Church. All right, so, so how do I be a tailwind in the life of my kids? Now, let me just say one more thing before we get it. Why does this matter? Look at verse 3. Why does this matter? The psalmist says in verse 3, here's why it matters. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The Hebrew word for heritage simply means inheritance. Proverbs 13, 22 says this. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I love it. Here's what he says. Dads, a good dad thinks third generationally when it comes to wealth. God says that's good. You need to be saving money. You, you, you need to be thinking about life insurance. You, you need to have a will. You, 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 you need to be investing if you can. All this kind of stuff. That's good. But notice in our text that the heritage is not the finances. The heritage is not the land. The heritage are the kids. In other words, God is saying this, the most valuable, dads, he's saying this, the most valuable asset we have in our investment portfolio is our kids. Why? They are the deposits we make into the future for a time we will not see. So because of that, steward well. Invest wisely. Now, how do we do that? Let me give you four quick things. And we'll call it a day. Here's, here's how we do this. He begins by saying in verse 4, look at it with me. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior. The arrows are the children. We get that. The warrior, the implication there, that's dad. Now, he's not exclu excluding mama. Moms play an incredibly great role. And if this was Mother's Day, we'd give a specific kind of word of encouragement to moms on that. But here's what he's saying. There's no such thing as an arrow living up to its purpose unless a warrior picks it up and puts it in its hand. Arrows were created to be in the hand of a warrior. And likewise, children were created to be in the hand of their father. The principle here is the principle of relationship. The idea here is leadership 101 says we don't lead out of position, we lead out of relationship. I can't influence anything deeply that I'm not connected to intimately. It's relationship. It's relationship. I love the story of the time Charles and Henry Brooks, this father and son, went fishing. It's a true story. A couple hundred years ago, they, they go fishing, and they spend all day out there fishing. That Later on that evening, separately, they both kind of reflect of their day together in their journal. And the dad, Charles, said, I spent all day fishing with my son, caught nothing, frustrated. Look at what his son reflected in his journal. Henry said, went fishing with my father today, the most glorious day of my life. 
It wasn't about what you caught. It's just about being with dad. It's just, it's just simple. You don't have to spend a day in seminary. Presence. Showing up. Relationship. Now, I, I, I want to temper this. I want to temper this. That doesn't mean you, you're at everything. So my, my dad, man, my, my dad is an awesome dad, but dad would get out his schedule before the athletic season, and he would write down, here's what games I can make. And I remember saying to him one time, well, how come you can't make the other games? And he says, because I work. <laughs> you like those cleats? <laughs> if I come to every game, you ain't going to have those cleats. <laughs> so I honestly... I think that was healthy that my dad didn't come to everything. He didn't make me the center of his world. So stop tying your self-esteem to the the idolatry of children. Stop making your kids your idols. They cannot bear the crushing weight of deity. Honor them, esteem them, but don't damage them by making them the center of your world. It's okay to not make everything. It's probably actually healthy. But you should still show up. People ask me all the time, you know, Brian, just talk to us about your life and what's made the most difference. Honestly, what's made the most difference was my dad did this with me. This book that you're giving away, it's not about me being a dad. I got a 20-year-old, an 18-year-old, a 16-year-old. I need prayer. (laughs) I thought it got easier. Somebody lied to me. But it's really looking at how my dad parented me. And look, I've, we logged all kinds of hours standing out on some Georgia pond, like the banks of a Georgia pond, and hours together. Most of those times, my dad's untangling my line for the, for the umpteenth time. I, I mean, like your pastor, I grew, I, mean, I grew up a huge Braves fan. I'm talking about the Braves of the 80s. Yes, yes. We, we stunk, stunk, stunk. And we spent a lot of hours in Atlanta Fulton County Stadium getting our hearts broken. I can't tell you the the scores of the game, but I can tell you dad was there. Relationship. Secondly is intentionality. Intentionality. Being a tailwind dad is all about being intentional. Like arrows, the idea of arrows, arrows unlike any other weapon in, in ancient warfare, you shot them and those things flew. It went by quick. And so it is with parenting. Someone once said that parenting are when the days are long, but the years are short. Parenting are when the days are long, but the years are short. We, we have a quick moment to influence our kids. Sort of like right now the NBA playoffs are on and we've been watching them, some of us, and when the point guard gets the ball and he starts to take it up court, one of the first things he'll do is he'll look at the shot clock. Shot clock says you have a tight window of time to put the shot up, so steward well. If you don't, it's a turnover. Likewise, parents, with our kids in our home, tight window of time. Steward well. And it doesn't last as long as you think it does. As someone once says, our influence over our sons only lasts as long uh, until they can smell gasoline and perfume. (laughs) Then the influence is gone. A bit overstated. So I just want to encourage us, dads, be intentional with that window of time. What does that look like for us? When our our boys turned 13, we did a rites of passage ceremony for them. I mean, we'd spend a great weekend together hanging out. Before that, my dad, when our boys turned 11, in preparation for the day when they would turn 13, my dad, the patriarch of our family, he would actually go out and buy a brand new Bible with this specific kid in mind. For the next two years, he'd do his devotions out of that Bible and would write their name in it and write prayers along certain passages in it. And then he'd fly out when they turned 13, and we'd have a great time hanging out. Put that picture up if you could. And then Dad would give him the Bible, lay hands on our son. It's my youngest, Jaden, there. That's me, my dad, my best friend. And we're just laying hands and blessing him. Just wanting to be intentional. Look, we, we made this up. But I just want to encourage you to do something to intentionally mark moments in the life of your kid. I mean, I just, there's, there's Jaden holding that Bible, and 
man, he's on cloud nine, and he's so excited, and man, he's in his devotion for the next couple days, and it's back to punching his brothers in the nose. But it, it's just, <laughs> they don't forget those moments. Make the most of it. Thirdly, there's the principle of relationship. There's the principle of intentionality. Thirdly, there's the, there's the principle of distance. That warrior pulls back and shoots that arrow, and it, it flies oftentimes at a target that maybe that warrior will never get to themselves. It's the idea of, I am now investing in my kids, and 50 years from now, I'm probably going to be very dead. And 50 years from now, if the Lord says the same, my, my kids will be very much alive. They are literally being launched out for a time that I will not see. This is exactly what the psalmist gets to in our text. Look, how our, look at how our text ends, verse 5. He says, blessed is a man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. In context, what he's saying here is, don't you know that the military strategy of every ancient city was the same? Fathers are going to die, so for the long-term viability of the city, I better train my kids in the art of warfare. So I, I got to invest in my kids. If I want the city to flourish, then my home matters. Your home matters. I remember some years ago, my wife and I were in London, and we took a stop by Churchill's War Room. Anybody here ever been to Churchill's War Room? Churchill's War Room is it's very underwhelming. You get to Churchill's War Room, and I had two thoughts. One, at how tiny and small that space is. I mean, you're ducking. It's closed quarters. And then two, I had, this, I had this other thought. It was from Churchill's War Room, that bunker, that he made decisions that changed the world. A tiny, unassuming space changed the trajectory of the world. That's our homes. That's our homes. You may be in an apartment, you, you, you may be in a subdivision, wherever. Your home matters. Running a Psalm 127 home could change the trajectory of the world. Dads, let's get after it. Let's end with this. There's relationship, there's intentionality, there's a principle of distance. But fourthly and finally, enduring vision. A warrior never picks up an arrow and just haphazardly just kind of shoots it. No, that warrior has a vision for the arrow. Dads, what's your vision for your kids? What's your vision for your kids? Without vision, the people perish. I remember when our kids were little, my, my mentor told me, he says, he asked me this question, what's your vision for the kids? And I kind of stumbled. He says, here's what you and your wife need to do. Just go away for a vision weekend and come up with a list of seven to ten kind of character traits that you want to instill in your kids. And I got all boys, and so I remember my wife and I going away and just, man, just kind of fumbling through. And Man, all boys, we, we want a strong work ethic. We, we want our boys to be great providers, so that was a huge vision thing for, for, for us, and that kind of drove a lot of decisions that we're even making right now uh, in their lives. Another one is we had a vision that our kids wouldn't be entitled, but they would be filled with gratitude. I read a great definition on entitlement. Consumption without contribution equals entitlement. Consumption without contribution equals entitlement. So we wanted kids to just be filled with gratitude. And even to this day, when we're out eating, they just know we're not treating the waiter or the waitress as if they're the help. We're saying thank you. My middle son, Miles, just graduated from high school, and he got a ton of gifts and everything, and he's knee-deep in thank you cards, not thank you texts, not thank you emails. We actually teach him to write. Because we want people filled with gratitude. This is vision. What's your vision for your kids? Because if you don't have one, I can guarantee you Satan's got one. Satan has vision for your kids. Steve Farrar says this. Look at it with me. If a man is passive and indifferent to the things of God and the spiritual leadership of his home, then attack isn't necessary. He's already neutralized. Men, let's step up. 
As I close, I just, I, I know I've put, put a lot on you, and I, I feel the weight of this, and I'm, I'm in the fight with you guys. And like I said, man, I, I blow it. I blow it all the time. But one of the things that motivates me as we close and just kind of go into a time of prayer is, you know, as a black man, I'm kind of unique in that we can actually trace our family lineage to pre-emancipation proclamation days. Uh, we can trace our lineage all the way back to my great-great-grandfather, a guy by the name of Peter Loritz. He was, he was owned by a German uh, reformed group of pastors, family. They actually led him to faith in Jesus Christ. It says of my great-great-grandfather Peter that he loved Jesus, was married to his wife for over 50 years. When the emancipation happened, they actually gave um, his, own, his former owners, gave my uh, great-great-grandfather 300 acres of land in Catawba County, North Carolina, and that's where my great-great-grandfather set up shop. And Man, he memorized practically the whole New Testament, even though he was illiterate, and he did that because he had his kids read to him from the same sections of Scripture over and over again. And that not only got the word into him, that got the word into them. He never got divorced. All of his kids came to know Jesus. One of his sons was my great-grandfather, a guy named Milton. Milton took his allotment of the 300 acres, and part of that land, he, he planted a church. The Thomas Road Chapel Church, right there. It's my favorite church to preach in, no offense. It can only seat 75 people, and Milton... And his wife, Anna, who were married for over 53 years, they're buried right there. They had 14 kids. All 14 of their kids came to know the Lord. Never got divorced. His youngest boy is my grandfather, Crawford Willer Loritz Sr., played in the Negro Leagues um, till an injury caused him to give up his career. As devastating as it was, it didn't devastate his faith. He led all three of his kids to faith in Jesus Christ. Him and my grandmother were married for 53 years. They both loved Jesus. My parents just celebrated 50 years of marriage. They led all of us, me and my three other siblings, all four of us to faith in Jesus. All their grandkids have professed faith in Jesus. In my direct line, there's no such thing as a headwind dad. There's no such thing as a man who didn't love Jesus or divorced his wife. Now, I know I just overwhelmed a lot of you. You're like, that ain't me. Maybe you're saying the, the temptation, saying my lineage. Papa was a rolling stone. Wherever he laid his hat was his home. And when he died, all he ever left me was alone. That's not my legacy, Brian. Well, here's my challenge to you men. Start one. Start one. <laughs> So that 150 years from now, your great-great-grandson is maybe preaching in Vegas, and he's challenging a group of men to step up. What an amazing message on Tailwind Dads. As Pastor Brian shared, I couldn't help but to think, what if we all allowed God, our Father, to make us Tailwind children? Let me move right to the thought of what a tailwind child or a tailwind Jesus follower would look like. As Pastor Brian pointed out from Psalms 137 verses one through four, a person who is intentional and enduring with purpose, it's a picture of a person who is not passive and indifferent to the things of God. It simply means turning or shifting in the direction that God has purpose for your life. You might be thinking, this sounds too good to be true or that you've gone wrong or done wrong for so long that God, our Father, will never forgive you. Well, listen, I've got good, no, great news. You can become a child of God starting right now at this moment. That's right, you in this moment can become a Jesus follower and it's as simple as A, B, C. You see, God loves us. He wants us to be his children. He wants to be our Father. His desire is to be in relationship. God of the universe wants you and me to live as his children. And now hearing and knowing this, we all need to take a moment to respond, to turn from our ways and surrender to God as our father. I told you, it's as simple as ABC. Listen, A means admit that you sinned and made mistakes. Romans 3 and 23 makes it clear, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, not some 
but all of us have sinned. B means that we need to believe in Jesus. Put your trust in the fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. When we believe in Jesus, John 1 and 12 teaches us that those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And lastly, the C just means that we confess that Jesus is our Lord and Savior. You see, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 make it clear with these words. If you confess your, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You see, we're not saved because we don't do the wrong things that we aren't supposed to do or because we do the right things that we are supposed to do. We are saved because of our faith in Jesus. Jesus, who lived a perfect life, died on the cross and paid the penalty for all of our sins. Then he was raised from the dead on the third day to prove that our penalty had been paid. Well, truth is, Jesus died and he rose from the dead on the third day so that we'd all have a way to forgiveness, that we'd all have an opportunity for eternal life, and that we all could live as children of God. You are invited to the family. We, Wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you've done or whatever you haven't done, God wants you to be his child. Right now, will you please make a godly decision and begin a relationship with Jesus? That's right. I'm asking you to become part of the family of God. Romans 10, 13 teaches us how to begin that relationship with Jesus by being adopted into the family with the simple words, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. The words of the prayer don't save you, or, or, but placing your faith in Jesus and surrendering control of your life to him, that's what saves you. So will you please join me right now? We can do this through prayer. Cry these words with me. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Lord, I know that you died for my sins. Lord, I know that you rose again from the dead. And right now, I surrender complete control of my life to you. I surrender my will to you. I submit totally to you. Lord, I turn from my sin and I place my faith in you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Now listen, if you just began a relationship with Jesus, let me be the first to welcome you, welcome you into the family, welcome you to the family of God. See, we want to walk with you. Why? Because Christians were never meant to live alone. If you gave your life to Jesus, please grab your phone, go to our app or to our website and fill out the digital connection card. You didn't just make a decision, you began a relationship, a relationship where we want to walk with you. Now, as we end today's service, let's join with our worship team and sing one final song.
our online service today. We want to invite you to join us Thursday nights at 6.30 p.m. or Sunday at 8.30 and 10.30 a.m. Have a great week.